Hey everybody, Ed here with the Digital Digest, and today I wanted to share a quick comparison between Sony's latest addition to the CyberShot family, the QX100 lens camera, which is designed to coexist with your smartphone of choice, iOS or Android alike, versus two compact point-and-shoot cameras that pretty much set the standard right now for the industry in terms of packing the most photographic punch into a pocket-sized friendly zoom camera. So I've got the RX100, again the QX100 lens camera, and then the RX100 Mark II. So all three of these cameras share the same exact Carl Zeiss 28 to 100 millimeter 3.6 times optical zoom lens. It's rated at f1.8 at its brightest, so a very fast lens, great for low light, even if you're starting out at the RX100 or the uh, QX100 or Mark II, which have an improved sensor design that allows for backlit illumination rather than front end, which ends up equating in just better overall low light uh, sensitivity. Specifically, the Mark II has a broader range of ISO, so that should tell you already what you need to know at least about low light sensitivity uh, pertaining specifically to the Mark II. Unfortunately, that does not exist on the QX100, even though it has the exact same sensor. So part of that is born out of Sony intentionally limiting what the QX100 can do, even though it shares the exact same glass as these cameras and the same sensor, despite, as I just mentioned, the fact that the original RX100 doesn't have that same sensor uh, shared by these two in terms of technical design. Otherwise, they are identical, 20.2 megapixel sensors, one inch in size, which makes them basically the largest pocketable uh, quality you're going to get on the market. So Sony has designed all three of these for enthusiasts that are looking to maximize photographic quality, as I've mentioned over and over. And they do accomplish that on all three fronts. In my opinion, all three are designed for completely different users. In fact, most will argue that the QX100 is merely a toy, and I'll explain why in a moment. But at launch, the QX really did seem like a phenomenal value because you're getting the exact same sensor, sensor excuse me, as a $750 Mark II and the exact same glass for $500. The only thing you're really missing, of course, is the balance of the body of the camera, which some would argue in itself is a deal breaker, and I understand why. The RX100, on the other hand, at $600, much more comparable to the QX, especially if you find the RX on sale, it'll probably get almost to being about a wash. So that's where, in my opinion, the comparison becomes far more direct. Even though the QX100 and Mark II share the NFC, Wi-Fi, same exact sensor, same exact lens, so they seem like the more comparable uh, pair, these two really are because of pricing. And in the end, whether or not you're going to pick up a QX100, in my opinion, comes down to lifestyle and, again, pricing. Arguably a $500 toy when you could pick up something like the RX100, which is definitely more of a practical, functional photographic tool, a real camera. But that's not to say that the QX100 isn't a real camera, because on its own merits, just by having that uh, lens sensor combination, it will outperform just about every other point and shoot camera other than what you're looking at right here on the table. So I can't call it a toy without reminding all of you that it will again outperform almost any point and shoot camera that you buy today other than these two. So who is it right for? Well, first I will say I always recommend going with one of these two, the original RXs, over the QX if you're really looking for a true camera. Uh, that's simply because even the original RX100, which was only improved upon uh, in the Mark II version, gives you a traditional uh, mode dial, and that allows for far more manual control. Uh, also, you've got everything built in here. You have a great view, um, electronic, uh, excuse me, LCD on the rear, which is the same exact res uh, resolution on the Mark II, but really, even in bright sunlight, if you throw this into the uh, sunny mode, uh, it really performs incredibly well. Now, it does lack the uh, hot shoe, which is on the later Mark II. I'll be getting to that in a moment. And some other design cues, improve, uh, improvements in overall performance that do make the Mark II a better camera. But again, the point I was making here is that having a physical camera in terms of practicality as opposed to something like a lens camera really does make a difference in terms of what you're trying to achieve. So, if all you're really trying to get is a phenomenal camera, then you really shouldn't be considering 
the QX in my opinion. It really should be the RX 100 if budget is your chief goal, the Mark II if really you want the best camera money can buy that can still fit in your pocket today. Another thing I want to point out is that the practicality of the QX, while an incredible novelty and a revolutionary piece of equipment, really gets lost for an enthusiast in my opinion because when it comes to getting the shot, capturing it in the moment, uh, that's not something the QX is really good at doing. Uh, even though the QX has that same sensor and lens combo, the fact that it has to pair up with your smartphone or tablet, uh, the fact that it doesn't have its own uh, way to actually frame anything because it's lacking an LCD or viewfinder of any sort, uh, that really renders it somewhat of, again, a novelty when compared to traditional true cameras. Uh, even though both the RX100 and Mark II lack an electronic viewfinder, at least the Mark II offers the option of picking one up. But that's just one element of what makes the QX, again, a very niche product that's only going to appeal to a small segment of users, or I should really say a very specific segment. How small or large that segment will be, we'll know soon enough. It has been selling out, but we don't really know how many of these Sony is pushing out of the factories. So until we see some solid numbers, I can't really comment on whether or not this product is a success as of yet. I know that, as I was mentioning before, as a purist, if you're wanting to take photos, trying to use this, the adaptation, the possible dropout in Wi-Fi, which even though I've experienced no Wi-Fi dropouts using this in tandem with my uh, Galaxy S3 or Note 2, it still leaves a lot to be desired if you are worried you're going to miss a shot just on your skills alone. I mean, the last thing you want is the camera to be the problem, and I am calling the QX a camera because, again, even though it is missing the viewfinder, uh, it can take stills on its own. It does incorporate controls right on the left side of the body, which I've shared in my previous videos. You have a shutter release button as well as zoom control, and really these are here not so that you can use this remotely just alone, but when it's actually mounted to your smartphone, uh, you are supposed to actually be holding the QX by the barrel, and this way giving your thumb easy access to the shutter and zoom, because it's definitely more natural to control uh, both the shutter button and zoom this way. The only downside is that when this is not actually mounted to your phone and paired up and it's being used on its own, you cannot remotely shoot video. Not that that's a big deal because I don't know anyone who really wants to shoot stuff on the fly without being able to preview or live view what they're actually uh, you know, taking either in a still or video format. Now speaking to overall performance, it really is right there with both of these cameras, even though it does have a reduced feature set. And by reduced, I'm being very, very polite. The best thing that the QX100 really has going for it is that lens sensor combination. Beyond that, the rest of the package really is novelty. And the niche market I've been referring to that this is all about are those of you out there, and we all know someone, even if you yourself aren't that person, that really does revolve around using their smartphone as their everyday uh, camera. And the whole fact of the matter is, is that, as I mentioned in previous videos, those people may fall into the rut of needing to upgrade their phone in order to get a better camera, or they may just desire a better camera even on their latest and greatest phone, because clearly uh, the argument here, if you're going to spend $500, isn't just that you want a better camera uh, on your smartphone. You want the best camera available, because again, the only two that really can outperform it are right here. So there's definitely a strong argument to be made for the QX for that group of people that are always about instant sharing. And even though the Mark II does have Wi-Fi and NFC, which should make it just as share worthy as the QX when it comes to those of you looking to socially network at a completely different photographic level, which is what the QX is all about, it, you know, the RX100 Mark II isn't going to deliver as seamless and experience. And even though Sony could update the software to do so, I highly doubt we're going to see that happen because that, again, is what differentiates these two models beyond the fact that, of course, they're nowhere near each other in design. And again, you require a companion device. So when the QX is actually docked onto your camera, or excuse me, smartphone of choice, it's fairly simple. Your screen turns into the viewfinder. And one thing I want to point out, you just saw me mount it on there. Again, your use form factor uh, is going to be like this. 
uh, and you will have easy access to controls and it will take some time to get used to this because again this is not a traditional uh, format for using a camera when we think about um, just about any point and shoot of course the RX 100s are far more traditional uh, and much more arguably well balanced even though there are complaints about grip and that's why Sony actually added their own third-party grip now to the uh, RX100 Mark II, which you can pick up for, I think, roughly $15, uh, which is expensive, but definitely useful for those of you who require a grip. The point is, is that even with its uh, biggest critique being that it's not the easiest camera to hold, uh, even though I personally have no problems with it, you're in a whole nother world now of pain using this device. So you really have to be in love with the concept of having... Uh, that instantaneous sharing feature because again with the Mark II even though you've got NFC and Wi-Fi which you know the NFC will instantly launch uh, play memories the same way this uh, QX100 lens camera will and then you can also do remote control the remote control here will not be as detailed as what you get here much like in the brand new NEX uh, Wi-Fi smart remote update uh, there's basically full control now even raw capture uh, that's another thing that's missing here. You know, no raw capture for the QX100. Clearly, they could have incorporated it. Uh, I would say that they still could, but I don't see any way that Sony's going to do that because, again, the QX is at a price point that really speaks to a customer base that's willing to accept that they're not going to get all of the manual controls. They're not going to have RAW. They're not going to have the same video quality capability of either of these cameras. Uh, the RX100 Mark II took the video quality we had with the original RX100 and took it up to another level by offering you 1080p at both 60i and 60p in AVC HD. Uh, whereas we didn't have uh, both modes available um, with the original, or excuse me, uh, it also incorporated 24p, so you had the full range of video capability, uh, something that wasn't uh, there with the original Mark I. Here we've got 1440 by 1080 in MP4, and that's it. So is the video quality going to blow away any smartphone on the market? Absolutely. Is it going to compete and be competent with just about any manufacturer's best pocketable point-and-shoot camera? check there as well. So you're not going to be uh, disappointed in that sense. It's just that people are going to continuously want to draw the comparison between these cameras and this brand new lens camera. And the best way of really summing things up is that you shouldn't be doing that. Even though through the course of this video I've been talking about features, price points, uh, you know, again, these are all right around each other, 500, 600, 750. So they're going to draw those comparisons. They really shouldn't because this is in no way, in my opinion, comparable to the experience found with either of these cameras. The only thing that really they share in common, of course, is the glass and sensor. So that's really where the relationship begins and ends, in my opinion. Uh, to me, the Mark II is clearly the best choice of all three. You've got tremendous versatility. This is the type of camera that many of you who buy entry-level digital SLRs and maybe overshoot what you're even able to do with it or have the time to invest to learn how to use it will be accommodated with all the manual controls here on the Mark II. It's the most refined of the RX100 uh, lineup, not that there's a lot of lineage. We just have the original Mark I, but that's a lot to live up to considering it was rated the best pocketable point-and-shoot zoom camera ever. Uh, same exact exact uh, zoom range, 28 to 100 millimeters on all of these. Again, same sensor, but the difference is we now have better low light sensitivity here with that design cue change. And as a result, it really does show up. It is not a gimmick. Uh, I've used both extensively, and there's no question the images out of the Mark II, in my opinion, are superior on the whole. Another big feature is the tiltable LCD which for some, again, maybe it's not relevant, but to me is something that I really wished had been on the original Mark I. We now have that, and that's something that the QX, again, is not going to accommodate. Granted, the QX can come off of whatever you have it mounted and act as a wireless camera uh, remotely, still using the viewfinder, but that's where things get awkward, just like the pairing, the handling. These are all things that really don't lend themselves to uh, the most user-friendly experience. And that's one of my biggest reservations right now about the QX. I'm giving it more time to grow on me. You all know that I haven't spent enough time with it to tell you that I'm in love or I hate it. 
I do know it produces great stills and video, but the usability and then the arguable factor of having an extra battery, another device to charge, and it will take a toll on your smartphone's battery life, although minimal, I'll tell you right now, it's not a significant effect. That's why Sony's selling it in the first place. If it really took a heavy toll on battery life, this product would never have made it to market. But back to the, the uh, Mark II, it's the most expensive of the bunch for a reason. I mean, the hot shoe allows you to throw on an electronic viewfinder, despite however expensive the price is. The point is the option is available. Uh, external microphones, external flash. This is the camera for the true enthusiast that really has no intention of being confronted with a limitation on a pocketable uh, best-in-class camera. And that's what the Mark II does well. The Wi-Fi and NFC really just cherries on top of the package. Uh, the step zoom, tilt screen, better low-light performance, more video modes, uh, really just all equate to an incredible package. And that's this is really my favorite camera right now other than my RX-1. There's no question about it. Really, these two, meaning the Mark II and the RX-1, can really do everything under the sun. Clearly, if I had to only own one and budget was the only factor, the Mark II, admittedly expensive, would still be uh, my choice over uh, the RX-1 simply because of the incredibly high price despite the value that the RX-1 represents. Now, when it comes to this direct comparison, that's where things are a little bit closer because of pricing. Uh, you know, only $100, maybe less, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, separating them. But again, usability. Do you always want to have to be unmounting and, you know, remounting this to your camera? Yes, I like the creativity factor of being able to actually just pull this off, use this to remote view, and get the QX lens into places that you normally wouldn't be able to fit your camera uh, safely, uh, but how often are you really going to be doing that? I think more of a creative concept and element for what Sony can do with software uh, down the road for this specifically is allowing you to pair up maybe two of these for 3D shooting. There are a lot of things that I think the average consumer this is designed for aren't thinking of. Again, I don't know how large an audience really is after a feature like that, but that's definitely a really cool concept. Of course, not there on the software side, but I imagine it would be really easy for Sony to incorporate that. But again, I don't see them doing that because this device is all about limiting the capability of the sensor and the glass, which is a sad story, but that's what the price point is all about. Um, the actual responsiveness of the uh, lens ring here for zooming is you know, pretty good, but the problem I've seen mostly is lag uh, in pairing with my smartphone of choice, whether it's the Note 2 or the Galaxy S3. Uh, or the uh, Nexus 7 second gen, I still run into lag here and there. And that's where, as I keep mentioning, from a purist standpoint, you may miss your shot or you may just not be able to compose it properly because you're not getting that same live view that you'd achieve with the RX100 or, of course, uh, the Mark II. So that's another thing to take into account. Uh, micro SD card slot only here. You know, no HDMI out, none of those things are existing on the uh, QX100. So this is all about being compact, but then the irony of that compact argument is that this is actually more difficult to fit in a pocket than the RX100 or the Mark II, which yes, the Mark II is a little bit thicker than the original 100, which is here on the left, you can see that because of the tilting screen and yes, slightly more hardware under the hood, but these definitely, in my opinion, fit far more comfortably in your pocket than a lens like this. So I think for people who are always carrying a bag, uh, women who have clutches, handbags, purses, this is gonna be just as comfortable as carrying a camera like this. But for men who don't, you know, sport a man purse, this is going to be a hard device to find a pocket for, in my opinion, just because of its shape. Uh, it's larger in many ways. Uh, the dimensions are just awkward. I don't know how you could put this in a front pocket without being a little bit embarrassed if you follow where I'm going. So that's an issue with the QX100 for me in terms of pocketability, practicality. But I think for people at the end of the day who really are out there to get the best possible image quality and video quality 
right on their phone instantaneously and be able to share it. Of course, on the video side, they won't be able to. The QX does really accomplish that. It's just you have to live with the idiosyncrasies of its own design cues and the pairing system, which aren't bad. It's just a matter of what your tolerance is for the trade-off, because it is a trade-off. Whereas I view both of these cameras as virtually uh, trade-off free. That's really my best way of um, balancing out the entire uh, video here is that that is the key difference between the compromise you're making other than actual price point itself. Uh, so I really like the QX100. It sets an entirely new standard. When you're comparing it to cameras like this, you're selling yourself short. Uh, if you're really interested in these, you should be buying these. Uh, if the QX100 speaks to, you know, the inner uh, geek in you that you love the technology you love that it's a wireless camera with an incredible sensor and an incredible lens and you don't really care about the fact that it's limited on the video capture side when compared to the rx100 and mark ii as well as on the still side you know no raw capture as i added they could really uh, make raw capture capable just on board on the qx100 and not allow you to share it with uh, your iOS or Android phone, because after all, for those of you wondering why RAW isn't here, the answer is really simple. There's no mobile format right now that supports RAW. So even the thing, as I just mentioned, they could do is support RAW to be saved directly uh, to the QX like they do with the NEX models now. You can't, uh, when you shoot with one of the NEX Wi-Fi enabled cameras like the 5R, 5T, or 6, you can save a RAW file directly to your SD card, but you can't share it with your smartphone or tablet even though the smartphone or tablet can control everything and preview photos or review photos and share them, you cannot actually transfer the raw capture. Just like the uh, 1080p video files are not going to transfer uh, from the Mark II simply because it's just not really a feasible process. The files are too large, end of story. But MP4 video on here still looks really good. I've put up two samples. Uh, thus far, both are low light based for those of you who really want to know what the uh, QX100 capabilities are like. It should serve to tell you quite well. But if it really came down to one of these two, I'm going to recommend the RX100 every single time. I really have met few people that have ended up purchasing this as per my recommendation or just by way of reading common news and you know regular knowledge that have ended up being disappointed with how the RX100 before, uh, performs. And that's really because it blows away all competition, as I've mentioned previously, as do all three of these. Of course, the QX has no competition, but that's where things really stand. And, um, you know, in terms of manual controls, that to me is the biggest loss here, which I can't justify from Sony's uh, perspective. I think they think that that always wired Instagram-aholic, Facebook-aholic that is going to want to use this really isn't interested in RAW. I agree with that, but uh, not having any manual controls uh, is a sad thing, and that's the last thing I'm going to demo because that's where I, I kind of lose them a little bit, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, pair this up using NFC, which is a nicety of this device, but it's something that I have uh, with the RX100 Mark II as well, so it's not unique to it. Well, it looked like it wanted to pair up there, but apparently it didn't cooperate. Let's try it again. Could just be that I'm missing the contact point. Yeah, there it goes. And we are pairing. In the meantime, I will mount this to the actual camera. I mean, smartphone. And that's part of it, as I keep saying. You know, if you're a purist that's technically only interested in a true camera experience, clearly you shouldn't be considering this. That's not who this is designed for. So now I've got, you know, the camera on, as we can see, it's mounted. RX100 Mark I right there, Mark II on the right. And you can see, relatively lag-free. I've already demoed this in other videos. Now in the shooting modes, you can see that's what we've got. So intelligent auto, superior, program, and aperture. But when I bring up you know, one of the RX100 models, you can see we're now in another league. And even if you don't know what all of these represent, more is more here, folks. It's not less. Uh, if you want to learn with a camera, grow with a camera, 
you're going to want more than only two manual modes. That's all I have to say. And uh, the fact that uh, all you get here are two different manual, it's, it's really just leaving you with something that is no more, it's actually less than a point and shoot. You could pick up an HX50V and actually get more manual control, of course, a hot shoe, much like the Mark II. So this really has to be all about your desire to instantly share whatever you shoot. Again, handling is like this, as I've demoed in other videos. Zooming in and out is natural with the actual toggle that's mounted on the QX. You can take a picture right here, um, like I just did, but I personally prefer going ahead and using the actual uh, shutter button on the QX100. After all, that's what it's there for. Uh, the only downside is when this is not paired up, when you're actually missing your smartphone, let's say your smartphone has died and the QX is alone, you are stuck, unfortunately, at that point with a camera that can shoot stills. So like this right now, of course, I'm still paired up. You can just shoot a still. And that, well, we had, it uh, didn't focus uh, on the proper subject, but that was an example of a blind shot. But you can't do anything with video with this. So maybe Sony will incorporate that. There is no video record button built into this device. So I guess that's part of an, a problem here. But uh, that's something I think they should have thought of. I don't see why a video record button wouldn't be built in somewhere here. So that just like you can shoot stills when you don't have a smartphone or tablet to pair up with, you should really also be able uh, to capture video. I don't see any reason uh, you'd be limited to still blind pointing and shooting. doesn't make sense. Uh, but overall, battery life, again, 200 shots. Both RX models are far superior to that. You're looking at uh, over 300 on the Mark II, roughly 300 on the Mark I. So really a lot more going for those in the battery department. And again, you won't have to worry about whether or not your smartphone is, you know, dwindling in the battery department. But as I mentioned before, I really have seen very little uh, damage to my battery life on my Note 2 or Galaxy S3 from even extensive use of the QX100. Keep in mind, of course, that as you actually use the QX100 for prolonged periods of time, dep uh, depending on how bright you have your screen, of course, that is going to eat your battery on your phone of choice. You all should know already how much screen brightness as well as on-screen time hurts battery life on most smartphones. That is the biggest drain out there uh, besides the LTE radio, of course. So with that being said, uh, keep in mind if you plan on using this for traveling and really as your pocket point-and-shoot camera, you better be prepared to have an extra battery for your smartphone because you will need to keep uh, brightness cranked up on most smartphones these days in order to perform in bright sunlight. Another problem you're not going to really face with these when they're set to uh, the sunlight mode for screen brightness. So even without an EVF, which of course this lacks as well, these are going to again outperform it and quite frankly they should. Last thing I want to point out, both of these have flash uh, of course built in. This does not have a flash. Uh, you can make the argument that none of these really need flash. They're all low-light dynamos, even though the Mark II improves on the low-light sensitivity with the uh, redesign of the exact same one-inch sensor. They all still perform really well and, again, will outperform any camera in their class when it comes to low-light sensitivity. So the flash, to me, isn't... That's probably the least of your worries. And, again, for those of you that are picking this up to really just take your online sharing to another level, in fact, a $500 level, you're going to get what you need without a flash. So overall, really like the QX100, but I think I've made my position relatively clear on which direction you should be going in, depending on what your particular needs are in this scenario. If you guys have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them. And of course, as usual, please feel free to subscribe. Later.